Thank you very much. It's wonderful to see um, such an excellent crowd gathering uh, tonight at this beautiful building. Thank you to the Foundation for hosting us tonight. Um, the topic, as you know, is what if history were written by the losers of war? And I think we can all agree that it's uh, a question of historical importance and extremely relevant right now in Europe and all over the world. Um, I should say that as the director just said, my name is Katia Babayani and I'm the director for policy at an organization based here in Geneva called Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. We are active in about 40 conflicts around the world and our colleague Pierre Hazan is currently, as we just heard, um, in Africa. But um, I'm very privileged to host this conversation tonight. We're going to start with Professor Weichlein. We'll go then to Professor Benun and we'll finish with Dr. Venman. Uh, the plan that we have for all of us tonight is that our speakers speak between 10 to 20 minutes. Then we'll take a couple of questions per speaker so that we have time at the end, hopefully a good 15 minutes for all of you to interact after you have heard all of the contributions, if you agree. Um, and so, Professor. Yeah. Merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. Uh, première fois pour moi uh, d'être uh, invité à Fondation Baudemer. Je suis très heureux. Mais je vais continuer en anglais, si vous voulez, euh, même que j'enseigne je à l'université bilingue de, de Fribourg, j'enseigne plus de côté germanophone, aussi anglophone. Il y a des programmes académiques euh, euh, anglophones euh, et euh, je vais continuer en, euh, en anglais. Euh, Est-ce que euh, chacun peut m'écouter derrière ou voir, c'est bon, les, les conditions bon. Conventional wisdom has it that the victors write history. Indeed, that all history is the history of those who win. The losing side is forgotten. This point was taken up by modern literature, French literature, German literature, exhaustively. Liter literature engagée, especially. German writer Bertolt Brecht was sure, and I quote, always the winners write the history of the loser. The weaker leaves the world and, lie, and only lies remain. Churchill, not quite a political friend of Bertolt Brecht, concurred. Trotsky was even more blunt. He, he said, the losers belong to the heap of history. The problem was that he and all his images were cut out of Soviet encyclopedias already by the early 30s. <laughs> Shakespeare had been a little bit more subtle than Brecht and even uh, the other writers in the 20th century. In Henry IV, the the <clears throat> uh, he, he writes, then with the losers let it sympathize, for nothing can seem foul to those that win. For Shakespeare, the more interesting figures were the losers, or better, the winners turned losers. Had he lived in the 20th century, and I'm sure Trotsky had been one of his main characters, the winners turned losers. In the last decades, a reading gained prominence that contested this winners have it position. Au contraire, they were arguing, it's the losers that understand history better, have a deeper knowledge of power, victory and defeat, and are better equipped to write history. Not the winners, but the losers are creative and innovative with regard to historiography. And the following remarks I want to shed some light on the muddy and murky waters, and you refer to that. This thinking derives from, in German, modern or 20th century political thinking. The second part then deals with the impact this approach had in recent literature. And finally, and probably more appropriately to the occasion, I will evaluate this approach critically. My thesis then would be it's not the losers that write history, it's the minorities. The minorities have an understanding that goes beyond victory 
it's the minority precision, minority historiography that goes beyond the binary language of winning and losing. So first, Karl Schmidt, the bad noir of constitutional scholarship in the Weimar years as well as in the Third Reich. He was famous after the killings of the SR elite uh, officers at top brass of, uh, um, of, the, of the military uh, for his infamous for his pamphlet Der Führer schützt das Recht. It's only the Führer that is going to guard um, German, the German legal system law. Schmidt not only was a deeply committed Nazi and a worthened anti-Semite, he also did not repent after 45. His glossarium, a blend of diary and think notebook after 45, is full of vitriolic attacks on the Western Allies, on democracy and on Jews. Under the programmatic title Ex Captivitate Salus, Schmidt published a series of texts from the years 1945 to, to 47, and he published them in 50. And that it's the loser's writing. <coughs> the, that it's the loser's writing, the better account was meant to be a slap in the face of the Western Allies. Even though the pure and simple apologetic intention, that's clear. If, if a deeply committed Nazi writes in 47, the losers are the, the, the better historians. If this simple apologetic intention of the Third Reich's crown jurist was openly revealed, then still Schmidt's thesis nevertheless found its way into the historiographical debate. I spare you the self-pity of an unreconstructed and unrepentant Nazi. Still, amazingly, there is something to be said for this idea, and there are lots of examples, and others have taken it up. <clears throat> First a note on epistemology. Though Schmidt and his followers, followers didn't elaborate on that, it seems that the proposition of, a, of the vaincu being the better historians taps into an older tradition that only the partisan and the engagé understands, understand history, not the distant observer from the hilltop of analytic reasoning. Marxist-Leninist historiography always had held that the historian has to be part of the workers' movement to understand workers' history. One could frame it differently. In order to understand defeat, you have to be defeated and know how it is like to be defeated. So this epistemological approach is not, is, 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 is not simple and plain Nazi speak. You can find the epistemology uh, behind that and in, in, with other authors. Objectivity is reached through partisanship and with, it, and with a bit of platonic epistemology. Um, not by coincidence, Schmidt wrote in the 60s a highly influential essay on partisans. Schmidt took Alexis de Tocqueville as his prime example. His interest in the French political scientist and politician of the 1848 revolution increased in the post-war period since Tocqueville was regarded as the most important theorist of the 1848 revolution, which seemed to have set Germany on a dubious course leading to world war to dictatorship. Tocqueville's noble family lost their social position in the French Revolution, and the nobility as a whole was delegitimized. Nevertheless, Tocqueville accepted the French Revolution and its results. He was defeated, and he accepted his defeat, he quotes. Schmidt does not see Tocqueville as a speculative theorist who grabs history as a whole with a bird's eye view, but rather as a realistic moralist. Not the deeper insight into the course of world history, but the realistic attitude to events made him a role model for Schmidt. Tocqueville does for Schmidt not have the seal of a sociological and psychological unmasking, not the vanity of the skeptics, but also no metaphysical ambitions. He does not want to find eternal laws of the world historical process, no three stages laws, no cultural cycles, and so on and so on. Of course, this was directed against the trials of Nuremberg, where the Allies <coughs> judged Nazi criminals 
out of a uh, juridic of, of, of what of, of, of moral laws of kind of pre-juridical um, um, uh, universal uh, 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 values. Tocqueville was a defeated man. This is the pivotal point for Carl Schmitt and where he compares himself to the French political theorist. I quote, in him all kinds of defeat came together and not by chance or not ju or, or just unfortunately but faithfully and existentially. Schmidt saw Tocqueville defeated on several levels, a defeated aristocrat, a defeated liberal, a defeated Frenchman, and a defeated European. With regard to the European Tocqueville, <coughs> the European um, th uh, theoretician, uh, Schmidt quotes Tocqueville's prognosis that two new powers, America and Russia, would, come, would become bearers and heirs of an irresistible centralization and democratization beyond Europe. So he saw, in, uh, he saw some, some, some prognostic um, faculties and, uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, Tocqueville. Most importantly, Tocqueville was not only defeated, but he accepted his defeat. Schmidt thus re-evaluates Guizot's dictum about Tocqueville, and Guizot once mockingly remarked, c'est un vaincu qui accepte sa défaite. For Schmidt, this was rather the arcanum of greatness that elevates the defeated Frenchman, he meant Tocqueville, above all the other historians. The defeat and its acceptance allowed him a clairvoyance into the future that separated him from others. In Schmidt's view, the defeated are not existentially defeated if they perceive per, uh, defeat as a new level of experience. Like Tocqueville, they are able to describe the revolution from within and from without, from both sides, from before it, from inside and after it, being, being from the French nobility and the nobility gone. The defeated write history because, for Schmidt, they can think on several levels, so an additional uh, in, uh, of several uh, levels, and they elude hasty solutions from within. Schmidt assigns to the defeated a strong prognostic power, the power to real prognosis, whether it's, it, is free, um, it's, it is free of ideological prejudices or idealistic flights of fantasy. Tocqueville could preview and foresaw with America and Russia and centralization and democratization Schmidt's present time. For Karl Schmidt, it is the ambivalence of before and after and accepting both roads, um, participation in nobility and in revolutionary war on the uh, nobility, of Christianity and agnosticism that provides for greater prognostic accuracy of the defeated compared to the victors. And Tocqueville was his prime example. He went on with more examples, for, for St. Augustine uh, and others, uh, always um, with several layers, with several roads. For Schmidt, it's the addition of several roads from within and from without and accepting both, um, both roads. The Bielefeld historian Reinhard Kuselek first developed Schmidt's thesis into a serious historiographical theory, aside from Schmidt's revengeful self-pity. But he does not go along with Schmidt at, on the same, at the, 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 the same road. Um, Koselek interpreted defeats as epochal episodes of experiences which brought the entire history of the past into a new light. For him, defeats stand for a general experience we all share, that things turn out differently than thought of, than conceived of. Things turn out differently. Change of experience drives met methodological innovation. According to Reinhard Kuselle, the gain in experience of defeat consists precisely in having to find the causes for defeat in apparently false premises of one's own reasoning and planning. Schmidt was different. For Schmidt, it was several roads um, adding on top of each other. For Koselik, it's, it's things turn out differently. Something must have been wrong with my premises. The defeated have to rewrite history since their previous conception of history and how it works failed. 
where Schmidt had emphasized above all the diagnostic and prognostic sense of the defeated. They had different experience. Kurselik changed the perspective. Now it's an experience of difference. Not different experience, but experience of difference. The change in methods triggered by experience refers to the past. Kurselik also differs from Karl Schmidt in another aspect. aspect. He, uh, while the possibility for historical prognosis, according to Karl Schmidt, was tied to great historical parallels. Are we now living again over and over in, in the financial crisis? Is it again 29? Is it again 73? So these, these, this, um, Schmidt remains, uh, Kroselek remains much more cautious. He, he historicizes prognosis and is, 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 the historian is, has no prognostic um, um, uh, facilities. Kroselek takes up Schmidt's Ex captivitate salus in his considerations on change of experience and change of, me of methods, but gives it a different twist that sets him apart from Schmidt. Kozelek generally assigns the change of experience, other experiences, um, as a type, as, as one type to the three types how to gain experience. We gain experience, and through this new experience, we change our methods. We are a learning system. Um, and um, Rainer Kozelek takes up this point. Three ways of historiography correspond to three ways of different experiences. The writing of history, the updating of history, and the rewriting of history. According to Kozelek, it's the new experiences, the defeat triggers change in historiographic methods. The fact that history is made by the winners in the short term, perhaps sustained in the medium term, but not dominated in the long term is a principle of experience that can always be redeemed. History is rewritten after the, the defeated look into their premises and change them. And so and he quotes them, um, he has lots of examples, he goes back to ancient history, to St. Augustine, to, to Thucydides, to Herodotus, um, then he goes on to, to um, uh, Machiavelli and others. All oh, they were, they, they were, they were had to deal with uh, with defeat. He quotes uh, Lucian. He quotes Giacardini. He quotes the German historian, the Prussian historian Niebuhr, and Scottish social historians. They all had to deal with some kind of defeat and change their premises. That's it's not addition, one experience after the other, in and out, but new experience. I have to rethink my premises and, of course, have to, um, have, have to do some, some self-critic. With Schmidt, you never find self-critic. You find, you find these brilliant formulations, these, these, these epigrams, um, but no self-critic. Coming to the critique. Successful and convincing historiography of losers involves self-critic. This is probably what Karl Schmidt's analysis lacked most. His account was uh, his account, as well as that of many others, can be read as propositions of how to win the next time. Of course we learn, but next time we win. So a kind of re rerun uh, of, of history. We have to learn in order to do better next time. That's not what makes historiography better. That's probably a manual for the Third, Fourth, Fifth uh, World War. Um, it is the experience of minorities, of minorities and subaltern pasts that goes beyond this paradigm of winning and losing. So I looked up where the term few of the defeated or la vision des vaincus um, came from. It derived, for instance, the, the few of the defeated first appeared in 1961 in a collection of sources by the Mexican historian Miguel Leon Portilla on the Spanish conquista from the perspective of the Aztecs the viewpoint of the Aztecs, and then he goes on to Peru. So the minorities, the defeated minor, ethnic minorities. There's an ethnic ring to, 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 to minority. La Vision des Vaincus, published in 1971 by the French historian Nathan Wachtel, um, elaborates on Peru's colonial history um, and um, goes back to the, to the telling of, of historiography, to the reasoning, historiographical reasoning by authors, 
um, from 16th and 17th century Peru. Here we find with the ethnic minorities um, that have to deal with their position, with their constant defeat, with, 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 a, um, with, with, with a situation of, 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 um, of setbacks and, uh, and inegalitarian um, um, uh, uh, social structures. Um, <clears throat> they experience not just, they have not just different experience, but the experience of difference. And so they add, um, they, they, they add to historiographical um, accounts by simply rejecting this binary um, um, uh, position of, of, of winning um, and defeat. Then, writing history against the grain of conformism is one of the great achievements of minorities. When you go to F, the subaltern studies, particularly the Indian uh, Indian authors, um, Chakrabarti, uh, Guha, um, um, uh, and others have pointed out that the, um, the, um, the, the writing against the, cr the crane is one of the great achievements of subaltern histories, of subaltern pasts, of the reasoning about, about the, the, the past of, of, of minorities. Benjamin's, it's what Walter Benjamin's quote in his uh, Über Geschichte, in his uh, in, uh, thesis on, uh, on, on, on Geschichte, that um, <clears throat> um, each generation has the task to, um, <clears throat> to regain tradition, to regain history against conformism, against <clears throat> that tends to overwhelm tradition. And conformism is, I would say, an expression of a victorious orthodoxy. So uh, looking into the uh, into historiography of, of minorities um, allows us to uh, uh, better um, resist the orthodoxy of conformism um, and 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 um, uh, the 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 all-encompassing paradigm of a of a leading um, uh, 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 concept. Um, leading concepts are um, um, put to question. Uh, leading concepts uh, are put to question by the historiography of minorities, since they have different experiences, not just uh, um, adding one experience to another in a quantitative sense, but in a qualitative um, point. That was Chakrabarti's point when, when he elaborated on the past of the minorities. Many thanks, and it's a little, little bit more than 20 Perfect. minutes. Sorry. <laughs>
The historian is not fond of white and black. It's yes and no. Always yes and no. Um, as you can see with Carl Schmidt, even in the dullest and dullest text, there's a crane of methodological truth you can work with. Um, um, so, um, so for for the historiography um, of minorities, um, the historiography for minorities was for a long time occupied with liberation. Mm -hmm. That's not a minority position. Uh, liberation, organization, um, winning and defeat, capitalism, development, the 50s, development, development. They love this talk in Paris and London. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about development. Um, they loved it. Um, so that's not indigenous talk. Um, that's, not, that's not their their historiography, their, their wording, their... So, the dark side is, or the other side is, you know, whether you agree, it's probably religion. Mm -hmm. um, the religious roots of minorities that set them apart from secular colonial powers, mm -hmm. first of all. Um, so the we see in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, India was founded by, com by secularists. Okay, Gandhi then was shot and he had a kind of his own religion or his, his, his own understanding of, of Satyagraha. Um, but, uh, but Nero, he was an atheist um, and, and his followers. So it, and the, the, re, the, the re emergence of religion as a driving force how to interpret one's past that took place say, after the period of, of decolonization, mm -hmm. um, in, 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 um, in a sense that, that is smaller, that relates just to the 40s and 50s, so then we talk about the 70s and the 80s. Um, um, and it's, it's um, so, a kind of, is it, um, the, 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 end of the, the end of the Cold War um, brought also an end to the master narratives of uh, liberal capitalism or uh, central central uh, uh, planning in economy the communist way so these master narratives then broke away after 90 and I would I would attribute um, particularly to the downfall of the of the of the Soviet Union um, um, would would see the downfall of the Soviet Union as, as, a, as a major breaking point for for new narratives and religion Or Nkrumah or Kenyatta, all these people. They were secular. They were educated in London, in New York, um, um, in, 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 in Pakistan. Uh, Jinnah, he was a London barrister. Uh, he had the finest clothing ever. Uh, he was famous for his suits. And uh, he didn't speak Urdu. And he didn't know a, 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 a word about, about his religion. He is the founder of Islam, of Muslim Pakistan. You wouldn't, you, you couldn't say such a sentence in Pakistan these days because it's totally different. <coughs> very interesting. I found very interesting the whole combination of religion and also the indigenous, uh, the capacity of indigenous thinking and processes of thinking to come up with this capacity to challenge the concepts of uh, the dominant concepts, yeah. mm -hmm. which makes you wonder whether in a in a situation of globalization what is indigenous anymore and does this mean that we're going to go even more back to religion or are we still having capacity to generate indigenous thinking between within uh, unique communities which is i think what makes uh, your research very relevant yeah. what is indigenous yeah v very good question for indigenous that's my family it's it's not that they that there is a ethnicity there we we refer to ethnic communities. They themselves may be somehow through language, maybe not through economy. First of all, I got, I got my, my kind, my, fam my family. So the bonding, um, the, 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 the cross-regional bonding, um, so doing ethnicity in contemporary ter terminology refers to some concept of, of shared values and practices, religion is one of those. Yeah. 
It's not the only one. Yes, of course. Excellent. Should I move on to our next speaker while everyone is digesting? Yeah? Ah. Mm. I go to the back and then to the gentleman here. The gentleman in the back and then the front. Oh, sorry, I, let me say something that I forgot at the beginning, um, to my shame, uh, that we have translation, interpretation from English to French, not from French to English, but all of us here understand French. So if you want to put If you speak out loudly. In French is yeah. no problem at all. Use it loud. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much for a great speech. I'm Aiden. Currently I'm employed but graduated from the Institute recently. And it was a great speech. I was wondering if like, we're talking about the subjugators and subaltern and from their perspective. But sometimes like these relationships are quite nested. I'm gonna go to a quite specific example from my background on Turkish and then ask a very general question. So I was thinking about this, like after World War I, Turkey was defeated, the Ottoman Empire was defeated, and then we're giving an independence war, and allies who supported Greek army was like the subjugated, and Turkey was defeated in the perspective of World War I. But in the independent war, we defeated the war, and in 1922, there was this coastal city, there were a half a million Greeks, and so when we, on the last part of the defeat, there was a fire, which the whole city was burned down. And it's still controversial who kind of set up the fire. So uh, my question was going to be about that. Of course, back then, there was missionaries, there were Western high officials, which were quite educated, and historiography was very well developed in the Western world. If you think about Turkey, I think historiography, the first historian we have maybe in 1930s, 40s. So even... Maybe a bit more quicker, if you Sorry, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. no problem. So even like when you look at it, the history was documented in the side of the Western Allies, so there wasn't even opportunity for the Turkish side. And I'm not taking a side, so it said, one side said, yeah, it was well documented, like Greeks uh, were kind of pursued by like Ottomans who were like burning up cities. So I was thinking this, so in these kind of situations, to which extent we can we can have a true value of some altering documentation and historiography, and also in this sense that like what is documented at the time of events happening, how can we know the true value of documentation as the valid history? Excellent. So Thank you so much. question in this like, nested relationship of some and subalterns. Fantastic. May I take the second one also? Of course. Yes, and then the professor will respond. Can you see any patterns um, between the loser's history of war and the winner's history of war in recognition of the human cost? We know that the winners don't do a very good job. <laughs> in this sense, the winners are liberals wherever they stand. In the First World War, the, the um, overarching um, assumption was that um, the end legitimizes the means. More cannons, soixante cannons, soixante cannons, soixante cannons. More soixante cannons. Um, or Tikeberta, same thing, uh, German side. Take, take, so. so the ends legitimize the means. That's a winner's story. Um, and the, the millions, uh, or Caporetto in Italy, if, have you been in, in Slovenia in the, in the Alps? It's, it's 2,800 meters high, and one million Italians and Austrians died there. It's unbelievable. You, you are exhausted when you get there, and then they start to fight. So it was, it was legitimized because it was good for the Italian uh, warfare and, and uh, victory in the First World War. The, the losers can't take that stance, can't take that position. Um, that the ends legitimize the means. Um, here here we see, would see a difference. Um, because um, um, the... <coughs> um, is it, the, 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 the incredible human costs um, uh, are on, mostly on their side. Not always, but, but... World War I did a pretty good job of taxing both equally. 
uh, World War II didn't. When we take the Russians out, the, the Russian bill is very different. I, I, I see that um, for different reasons. Um, in the Second World War, the bill, and if you take colonial wars, the, the Algerian War, um, <coughs> the, 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 the Malayan Wars, um, the Indonesia, Vietnam. so they're, they're Vietnam. Uh, uh, Vietnam. It's, it's, inc it's incredible. Next question. I, 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 I could go on and on, and it's probably not a perfect answer. It's, it's saying in, in, in headlines, answering in, in, in headlines and with, with kind of quotations. I would should, um, sh um, should have answered it more, more, more thoroughly because it's a very important question. Um, Turkey, um, um, what is, I understand your question as are there any shared um, historiographical concepts um, that, bridge, that, are, that bridge the gap? Maybe between the Greeks and Turks, maybe between between other opposition. Did I get your question right, or is that is that? Um... No, my question was actually specifically was this. I think when you when we look at when I look at for for example like the general history between the West and for example Turkey's relation, which we had like, quite a lot of wars and especially World War One and afterward, the historiography was very well developed in the West already. There were many historians, and at the time, even like missionaries were, mm -hmm. or like officials were very well educated. They had their journals, so they were documenting the things. But for Turks, it started even afterwards. So when we think about any kind of issue in independence war or in World War II, World War One, mm -hmm. that subaltern history from <coughs> Turkish perspective wasn't even there. Maybe we started writing about it in the 40s, 50s by people who's never even experienced it, but by what they are doing. So in this sense. How can we bridge the gap between what is documented in history, or, for example, in Turkey's case, how can we even know actually that like, Turks were not trying to kind of like cover their like misdeeds? And it's not just in Turks, but if you think about any type of relationship between West and the rest, historically was very well developed in the West way before. So I think there's kind of an intellectual gap between the West and the rest of the world. So even if you look at the number of historians today. Even if we have a historian in Turkey, they study in the UK or the US. So it's a very different level of experience, even from the side of the intellectual. That's a very important question. Problem is, I can't give you an answer. I can, I can point to two concepts that were developed, and they failed to bridge the gap. The first, the first narrative to bridge the gap was modernization. Enrichissez-vous. Um, coûte que coûte. Um, um, economy, development, win-win, um, uh, another liberal narrative, win-win situations. If, in, if you take part in, the, in, the, in, in the, this kind of economy, it's for your own advantage. So this, this failed in the end. Then, then the, the modernization driven, modernization theory driven nation building probably got stuck somewhere. It was effective in the early days in, in, in institution building, but then it got stuck. The, the other one is human rights, the last utopia, as Samuel Moyne has it. Um, human rights then since the 80s and the 90s tried to bridge the gap. At least we all share human rights. Um, that's, that's our, our narrative uh, we, uh, <coughs> we share. Um, from subaltern studies, this point has a few has not been really welcome because it's again it's a Western concept. It's uh, has been derided as more or less a uh, s deriving from somewhere between what is it Weimar and Walden Pond. Um, um, <clears throat> if you take 19th century um, uh, uh, author authors, so I can only come up with same with. With concept that fails to bridge the gap. Let's move on to our next speaker, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, do you want to speak? Okay. Oh, it's okay. Um, I'm going to be the person on this panel of seeing the, that I spent the last two and a half years um, being part of this. Uh, so I'm going to be 
unapologetic and gonna make a plaidoyer for you guys to read this. Um, and when you go and see the exhibition to read it, for the simple fact that there's been a lot of brain power which was gathering for three years, actually in this very room, there was, there's a different table which goes sits here and people were yonking texts back and forth and they were being sent to Gallimard in Paris, being translated from English to French and so on. So there's a lot that comes in here. The reason I'm saying this is, um, is because two weeks ago I got a contract to begin to move this exhibition to June 2022 to the Deutsche Historisches Museum in Berlin. Now, for people who are not um, familiar with the, Deutsche, the story of the Deutsche Historisches Museum, the Deutsche Historisches Museum, which is Unter den Linden 2, so that is the, the central museum for German history um, at the beginning of Unter den Linden in Berlin, um, this is the Zeug House of Schinkel, so this is the armory. And the Swiss is the director. And the Swiss, Raphael Gross, who's a good friend of mine, is a director and a Jew and the world's expert on Carl Schmidt and the Jews, um, by the way. Um, and I'll tell you a little secret is that when I saw that there wasn't enough of Carl Schmidt at the beginning of this, I actually whispered in the ear of Jacques Bastold, um, the president of Fondation Wood and I said, could I, as a Jew, um, ask you to buy a text by a rotten anti-Semite? Because you don't have it in the collection. And Fondation Wood actually went and bought a copy of Borsa Horno upon my request, so we actually have it side by side to Mein Kampf. And you can see it on page 71 of the catalog. The reason I'm mentioning this is, you know, if you translate the words war and peace or Gerepe into German, holding an exhibition about Krieg und Friedens in Germany is not a simple task. Specifically for Germans, it's not a simple task. Uh, and it becomes a much harder task in the Zeughaus, which is the armory of Bismarck and Prussian war-mongering, if you want, um, of the unification of Germany in blood and iron um, in that building. And now we need to come, and I have three problems that I'm dealing with and I'm going to share with you. And those are my three points and they're going to be very short. I teach in university in East Germany, students who are in their mid-twenties, um, Erasmus Mundus Global Studies, they have a brilliant program, 5,000 applications, 55 places. They do a master's in Global Studies in four semesters in four universities. So a semester in Leipzig, a semester in Vienna, a semester in the London School of Economics, and a semester in Paris at the École Normale Supérieure and they are compelled to study the language of each place where they come to, which is a rather good education, I would say. For them, for my students, the condition of peace is self-evident. This is a generation where there is a self-evidence of peace, right? 70 years, no war in Europe. Many of my students are not European, but even if they come from India, they don't have a concept of the fact that they live in a country with the worst border probably on the planet, which is Kashmir today. So that's one million soldiers armed on both sides with two nuclear powers. Um, and for 70 years, relatively speaking, there has been plus or moins peace. Granted, we had Yugoslavia, we had different genocides within countries and so on, but we did not have a world war. They have no conception of the fact that historically this is an Ausnahme, this is an exception. This has not happened since the Pax Romana, basically. But it is self-evident to them. And for me as their lecturer to explain to them that they need to do something for it, or that it can kick, it can turn off very fast. Ask one million Syrian refugees in Germany who just woke up one day and suddenly had a war on their doorstep, um, they don't have that conception. And that is a challenge for someone like me coming now to the German Historical Museum and doing an exhibition about peace. Right? Even the objects. I have five, I have a collection of one million so that 
This is the third biggest museum collection, Deutsche Social Museum. The biggest is the British Museum, the second biggest is the Metropolitan, this is the third, the Smithsonian is the fourth. So it's one million objects. I have any type of armament that you can think of, ranging from the Middle Ages to, to a nuclear missile where the head was taken off, which the Russians left in Germany. It's part of the collection. I don't have one single object which demonstrates peace because it's a very nebulous concept. So I have a treaty. Treaties come after trauma. Westphalia comes after a third year war and a third of Europe dead. The UN Charter comes after the Second World War. The Genocide Convention after the Holocaust. The Refugee Convention after the 1945. The Geneva Convention for Civilian Mind, which is coming out in London in a month. Bloomsbury after what happened to civilians. Responsibility to protect after Srebrenica and Rwanda. Okay? Treaties come after trauma. Fine. But what we do after the treaty? How do we tangibilize peace? This is a serious challenge. And if we don't, then often historically we lose it. That's point number one. The self-evidence of peace. Point number two, and again this comes back to Karshnit. War in and of itself, war, we speak about war and peace. War in and of itself is neutral. Switzerland has an army for 700 years, hasn't had a war. We would not consider Sweden to be a totalitarian regime. I'd like to tell everybody that Sweden has reinstated the draft this year. If you're 18 years old, you go to the army. And I don't think we would call Sweden a non-democratic society. The reason being Putin and so on. So the war in and of itself is not the problem. The problem is aggression. And those are two very different concepts. And the reason I asked for this one now to buy Karlschmidt's Gross Arm Ordnung was because this is the epitome of aggression. Right? And this issue of aggression and having aggression pass by is one of the central issues that we're playing around with, that I'm playing around with, in trying to build a concept paper for Berlin. And it was certainly something that we were very clear about in the exhibition here. And it has to do also with our concepts of what is a hero. The average hero is usually in history male, warlike, you know, the Napoleons and so on and so forth. How many times do we actually remember peacemakers as heroes? Very few. Occasionally, you know, does anybody in the room know the names of the people who did the Good Friday Agreement. Everybody knows Jeremy Adams and Martin McGuinness and so on and so forth, or Ian Paisley. But do people remember David Trimble and John Hume? Much less. Much less. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I wrote in, in the catalogue where I said, in, you know, in one of the rare episodes in history, speaking about Pactas and Zervanda, the principle that treaties are to be kept, Christianity had its ideas of what to do with it when people were non Christian. Actually, the principle of keeping treaties with everybody is a Muslim principle. It's a Quranic principle, including with polytheists. And it's very interesting to note that in one episode at least, the peacemakers are remembered. That is Salah Adin and Richard the Lionheart. We remember them as peacemakers in the Middle East where Salah al-Din vouches and sanctifies the fact that all Christians shall have a right to pray in Jerusalem under the protection of the Muslim crown. It's a rare incident. <coughs> the third point I want to make, and this has to do with aggression, is the loss or the, the, the danger to multilateralism. And this, this exhibition, partially began in a conversation that Pierre Azan was now in one of the borders. We are on the other side of that border. 50 soldiers were killed, I think, two days ago in Mali. Am I correct? Yeah. Right. Um, so he's in the midst of it. And we began to speak about this exhibition here in Geneva approximately the same time that Trump was voted in and he walked out of the Iran 
nuclear treaty. Now, I do urge you to see the exhibition. When you look, go to look at the exhibition, go to look, and you can see it on the catalogue on page 71, go to look at a, a tiny little telex, which is the retreat of Germany from the Council of Disarmament in 1930. It's a telex, okay? It's a small, tiny telex. It took, between 1918 and 1930, 12 years to build the regime of the first Council of Disarmament in 1930. Germany with Hitler walks out. It took 12 years to build something, and it takes a one-minute telex to crash it off. It took 15 years to negotiate the Iran nuclear deal. It took a Twitter of one second to take it off. There is, and this is a cause, of, you know, we historians are very, very traumatized by the, the issue of causality. We don't like to, you know, we can't stay around it. But I can make a causal claim which says that the minute we end multilateralism, war will come. Ipso facto. And the loss of multilateralism or the retreat from multilateralism is not a force majeure. It's not a God given curse on earth. It is made by people and mostly made by publics in the sense that they are silent to their own governments walking out of multilateralism. Right? Because if it's the other way around, where publics rebel against their own governments and saying, no, you're not walking out of the nuclear deal. Or, you know, how many people in the room actually know that the nuclear agreement between Russia and the United States of 1990-1991, which reduced the nuclear arsenal of warheads on both sides, has been walked out by both sides in the last two months. Right? Um, that doesn't make the headline news. Boris Johnson might make the headline news of Brexit. Who gives a damn? I mean, who? Oh. Yeah, there's a disproportion. There's a disproportion here of the of the risk that we're dealing with. Seriously, these three points: the problem with the self-evidence of peace, especially to a younger generation; the problem with aggression and identifying it. And by the way, when I say aggression, yes, Russia invading Crim and then Eastern Ukraine is aggression. But the no-fly zone by the U.S. over Libya is equally aggression. And the American invasion of Iraq, including with the Brits, I think the ICRC count of body count on Iraq, if I'm not mistaken, is close to a million. That needs to tell me that Mr. Bush, the son, and Mr. Blair have the blood of one million people on their hands. And that is classical aggression. An invasion which has no logical reason. And the third point, which is very much connected to that, is the danger to multilateralism. Multilateralism is not nice. You know, negotiating a treaty for 15 years, especially if you're negotiating with Persians, you know, trying to negotiate with them, it's not very easy. But that is the whole nature of it. And at this stage, what I'm trying to do, and this is what we try to do in this catalog, I feel, was to point to that, even in the different three phases, right? The build-up to war, the time of destruction, the making of peace. Thank you very much, Professor. I see a question already back there. Please go ahead. Um, my name is Paul Gardner. I'm a professor at American University of Paris. And I want to commend your statements. I've written a number of books on the same subject. The last one is uh, IR theory, historical analogy, and major power war. The previous one was the failure of the current World War I, and one before that was World War Trump. <laughs> and your points, there's several points I want to make here. First, it's not, the, the critique of multilateralism is correct, but we are moving into a period that is in between World War I and World War II in terms of the alliance formations. Okay. So, so that's the theme of my last one. The, so the, the, the point is that, but I want to get back to your first point about peace. The illusion of peace was also an illusion in the late 19th century. When if you were 
situated in 1898 and 1900, someone asked you where would the next war come, you would be from that. And yet you would point to which countries? If you were Britain. France, by the way, or Russia. Germany would have never crossed your mind until about 1901, 1902. So we're in the same situation today where in the Cold War, Soviet Union was, you know, was supposed to be the, the next war. Maybe Russia was still there. But China is something you told me. Both of the of the Trump administration. So, so these parallels in historical um, transformations and alliances, I think, are, are coming to, to a, new, a new phase and a very dangerous one. And I just want to say that's really brief, your, your basic analysis. Thank you. One more question for Professor Benham. Uh, the, the lady the ah, perfect. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Michelle Glazer. I'm from the Institute. And I was just wondering what you think the process of justice seeking has to do with the winners of wars being the writers of history. I'm thinking particularly of like Victor's justice and mm -hmm. how moving forward we can kind of work to see if the victims of wars uh, can also be justice seekers and the victimizers of war as well, but we justice seekers that can be some sort of Thank you. Um, just to come back to, to the point of my colleague over here on, on alliance formation, um, I think it's interesting to note that at least in the history of diplomacy, we have something which is called the shift in democratic diplomacy. So for the people in the room, um, the average amount of people who act in Europe, so the Treaty of Westphalia, which comes after the 30-year war, about 33% of the European population is annihilated between 1618 and 1648. Just for your numbers, there were about 3,000 people on the entire European continent, which means the planet at that stage, which actually knew what was in the treaty. Because the treaty was under diplomatic secrecy. Metternich, 200 years, 180 years afterwards, is completely appalled by the that the diplomats in Vienna shall take out to the public, God forbid, what is being discussed in closed rooms. When does this change? This changes in Verdun. This changes in World War I. This changes in the song. And go down to the exhibition and look at Arnold Zweig, the brother of Erziehung in Verdun. Right? Growing up in Verdun. This idea that alliances suddenly forfeited and committed entire nations to spilling two million or I don't know how many million people in the song without the public signing off on it. And that is where democratic diplomacy comes in, whereby from that day on, publics begin to hold their own diplomats accountable to the kinds of alliances that countries do. They didn't do that beforehand. The idea, for example, of having a declaration of war on television and Lee Stevenson against Zorin in the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Zorin says to Stevenson, I'm not in an American court, and Adley Stevenson answers, you're in the court of world public opinion and you can answer. Are you putting nuclear missiles in Cuba? Answer yes or no, and don't wait for the translation. Um, that would not have happened before. The paradox is that democratic diplomacy is actually very good sometimes, because it does hold governments accountable. That's to my colleague there. And on the issue of the illusion of peace, there was a book that was published in 1912, which made the theory that war is no longer possible in Europe because of economy and the gender. Globalization. Exactly. So just you know, in terms of the, the illusion of peace. And nevertheless, and this is a number I've just come up from because my colleague here sits in Freiburg. Um, and I'm doing this research to get the exhibition in Berlin to try and explain to my students what is the benefits of peace. So, here's a number for you. In the German border with France between Trier right down to Basel, in 2017, and I'll give the public a rough guess of how many people in France got up in the morning, crossed the Rhine, so from Colmar, to Freiburg, went to work in Freiburg. Their Arbeitsgeber is in Freiburg. Their children are in France. Their country, um, 
Krankenversicherung auf, auf ja, Französisch. Ähm, äh, Health Insurance. The, 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 the Assurance, Assurance Maladie is French. The Rentversicherung is French. Right? They live in France. They get a, a, a pay slip from their German employer. And all the other systems are totally coordinated. They don't even do anything. Ladies and gentlemen, the number is 980,000 people. That's 20,000 off 1 million. If you would have come to the average Frenchman in 1945, after what the Nazis did in Plateau de Grières in France, and you would have told them, listen, 70 years down the line, there are going to be 1 million people who are going to cross the border every day, and everything's going to be fine. Right? He would have looked at you and said, you know, you've been smoking some very bad substances, which are probably not very good for you. Yeah, it's the same thing that Jacques Delors said in 1952, one day there will come a time in Europe where people drive their car from Lisbon to Stockholm and will not show a passport. There were people who were looking at Delors as if he was completely mad. Right? <laughs> you know, Salazar was still, I mean, a dictator in, 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 and the Iron Curtain and so on. All I'm saying is that, you know, we're living in a very special time. <laughs> I'm very aware we still have Dr. Van Moet, if you don't mind. But the justice question? Oh, and the justice question. In peace treaties, on the justice question, there is, I'm just holding a book here, which was done here in Geneva. What is a just peace, which was done at the time for the Geneva Accords when they were done here between Israelis and Palestinians and so on. There is an Archimedes point of, 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 reaching a justice, a condition whereby both parties might not feel it's totally just, but they cannot get better. And I'll give you a point of optimism on your question of justice. Think of the following. All the upheavals in the Middle East. Right? You've had countries which have been broken, Yemen has been broken down to three countries, Libya has three countries, Syria, Iraq, I can carry on the list. In 1978, a peace agreement is done between Egypt and Israel after four rather bloody wars. The person who did that treaty is killed, so that assassinated because he did the treaty. For, and it's a very hard treaty to do at the time, and Anachem Begin has to give up settlements and so on, and evacuate Sinai, and whatever. Forty years later, after three regimes, including one regime which is the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which is the father movement of Hamas. When Morsi comes and becomes the president of Egypt, he is asked about the peace treaty with Israel considering what's happening in Gaza. And he says, we have a war with Israel on Hamas, but the peace treaty, and he uses the Arabic word muqdas, which means sacred, holy. Now, in a region that has gone completely upside down, to have a, suddenly a peace treaty where everybody looks at it as if it's this, this solid rock of marble in the middle of everything which has gone on upheaval is rather promising in that region. And I, you know, call me an optimist, but and I think that one of the reasons for that is exactly the justice question. It is the lowest common denominator point of Archimedes where you couldn't get any more from each party. And for all that matters, both sides might have not come up completely satisfied but there was a justice in the sense that this is the best that can be achieved. Compare that to what happened in the First World War with Germany, and you see the difference. Right? Excellent. If our host agrees, and if all of you are in agreement, I propose that we continue until 8.45 to give an opportunity to Dr. Venman to also present to us, and then to take more questions. So I hope you're still um, excited and... and um, not too tired. Thank you very much, um, Katja, and thank you very much for the uh, Woodmer Foundation to host this event. C'est un grand événement et un grand plaisir, surtout d'être introduit comme un local. Même de local de l'autre côté de, de la ville, <laughs> de la Genève internationale. Um, I'd like to start out with to ask who is for the first time at the Bodmer Foundation here today? It's a lot of people. <laughs> so this is, this is amazing because everyone who had the hand up, you should know this is a jewel in Geneva. 
um, you should go frequently and particularly go to the exhibition and buy the book. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, the, other, the other thing I think which is really a new challenge tonight we put up, that I thought having the slot after lunch would be always the most difficult speaking slot. But today I learned the most difficult speaking slot is to speak after two historians. <laughs> um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, as, as was introduced, we are uh, in the middle of Geneva Peace Week, and many of the issues and uh, realities that we have spoken about here uh, are not a distant theoretical um, subject, but are happening right in front of your eyes in this city. We have in Geneva Peace Week some of the finest experts and, and activists and, and, and also diplomats working on peace. And it is a gathering of over a thousand people that are thinking about how can we make a difference? How can we work on that peace that for the young generation and many seem to be so self-evident? So right here in Geneva, Geneva Peace Week is an, is an annual occurrence in the second week of November. <laughs> And we are particularly pleased with this event here at the Bodmer Foundation that we can broaden the conversation, uh, not just in international Geneva, but also span across the lake, even though we may still need to wait a little bit for the bridge to be built or the tunnel to be built. <laughs> Sorry, this is the local joke. Huh? But being the local, I can do it. No? So, <laughs> very good. Well, let me reconnect to the, to the question of uh, history uh, written by the losers of war. And I would like to perhaps broaden it out slightly and to think about the current significance of history writing on some of the conflicts which are dominating the news. Um, we see terrible pictures on Yemen, on Syria, on Libya, on Myanmar, on the DRC. The list is very long. But the way individuals the way groups, the way governments go about writing history and making sense of what happened and making sense of what the history of place has been is a fundamental exercise that peace builders are concerned with. Uh, during Geneva Peace Week, this topic has been made an issue both in our focus theme on building peace in Europe to wake up the young and to wake up the old and those in the middle that we have to get our act together and get mobilized. Um, the issue came up today in a conversation about peace-building perspectives between China, Japan, and Korea. And oh boy, is there a work to do for historians. Um, so all of these things are right and happening in front of your doorstep and are real issues. But let me perhaps place our discussion of history writing into uh, the current global context where, of course, the history writing by a dominant power, by a winner or by a minority, is being conducted by so many different stakeholders in the writing of history. So there is today, in so, with, through social media, through official government policy, there is a generation of multiplicities of history that is perhaps different from the historical uh, um, uh, evolutions that we have so masterly heard from, which is really a different nature and characteristics of how today we can think about history writing. So, on the one hand, there is the multiplicities of histories, but then also, in the same context, comes the competition between the histories and who gets ear from whom. That is, I think, an important element. Because you do have the official history writings, the official commission, the professionals who go about it. But you have also in social media and in the global, the global uh, cyberspace, you have niches where groups build in groups that define their own histories and that only believe in these. So this is, I think, a new context for how we make sense of history writing and where the concept of winners and losers is somewhat less relevant. But I think what is relevant from a peace-building perspective is how we go about assuring frameworks so that this plurality, this pluralism of histories can be managed. 
In a sense, history writing and the way we go about making sense requires a certain elasticity in the way, as you have said, in the way we update the history, in the way we write the history, and in the way the way history is rewritten by different stakeholders in a social system. So, when, when we have multiplicities of histories, when there is competition between histories, what becomes much more important is the way how we structure the dialogue about the elements of these histories. And that, of course, how you structure dialogue is at the core what peace builders and peace mediation professionals are all about. So there is a way that one can think about creating a unity of purpose that has a plural dimension to it. There is the possibility of structuring designs and processes that mitigate the risk of having enmities and new enemies being recreated and reinvented so that war is reinvented and that there are specific uh, groups in society that may become scapegoats, which is, by the way, a phenomenal exhibition which is part of Geneva Peace Week on show at the Geneva Welcome Center. Now, let me make this all, oh, let, me, let me close this segments of reflection also with what the issue of process management is about, is the definition of the rules of the games of that dialogue. How the processes about making sense of histories and the, the management of this multiplicity is being done. That is, I think, what peace builders are good about, that the dialogue about histories has rules. And that is, I think, what we can, can, uh, can perhaps look at, the importance of <coughs> placing history-making into a peace process uh, understanding. Now, let's make this a little bit more concrete. I mentioned Yemen, Syria, uh, Libya, and let's think for a minute about what history-making may mean to the future of Syria. Right across the lake, a new constitution-making process has started. And if we are looking and understanding the type of data which is available today about understanding and how creating understandings of what happened over the last 10 years, we may come to the conclusion that Syria is the most intensely reported on and data-rich conflict that has ever existed. There are millions and millions of data points about specific incidents, there is millions and millions of data points in clouds of social media conversations that are analyzed through artificial intelligence of where, where, are, um, where are specific um, attitudes and uh, where are specific, uh, where, where, what are the types of conversations that are happening in specific chat rooms. The degree of information available to make sense of what has happened is completely different today because of the cyberspace than it used to be in the past. So this is a new reality. What is therefore the biggest importance of making sure that the future of history writing for Syria can take place? It's the protection of that cloud of information. Because all of the history of Syria is in some cloud somewhere. And one cyber attack on that cloud and Syria's history over the next 10 years is gone. <laughs> this is a new type of challenge for the discussion that we have on history writing, how we go about this. And it may be very true that the history writing on Syria will take place by groups both within Syria and outside Syria. There are surely many losers of the war that have been part of the government's regime that have lost family, that are very very, very broad and, and affected by the war. They want to have also a truthful account of the war and not necessarily a victor's account of the war. So the same with the many diaspora communities which are all, all over the world. In particular, one may point to the, the current writing of history that happens in the London environment, in the German environment, and also in the Swiss environment. Many young people that have fled the war have made PhDs in some of the, West, the West's best universities, and they have started to make sense of this exercise. If you are looking at young academics who've been at great universities, uh, including the Gravity Institute, 
Um, there, are, there are a lot of the sense making which is, which is taking place right now. So let me perhaps conclude with a, with a, with a number of open questions, which is how can, we in an, how can we go towards a spectrum of understanding of our past? A spectrum of understanding of what are the histories out there? What are the bounds? And what are the kind of processes that we can design so that there is an ability of a, of a plurality of voices, of the multiple histories uh, that are out there, so they can stand together at the same time so that we avoid the need and the urge to have a unifying account of history. Thank you, Dr. Venman. I suggest that we have a couple of questions for Dr. Venman and then uh, we can pose closing questions to the whole panel, if you all agree. The floor is open. <coughs> yes, please. Hi, good evening. My name is uh, George. This is the My question is mostly about uh, what you're saying in Syria, about the cloud and information. Uh, uh, true, there's a lot of information, but despite that, we still see in the mainstream uh, reporting that it's extremely biased and as if they don't look at the information, they don't purpose, I don't know. Uh, and to add to this, uh, the history of Syria man, might end up being like the history of Lebanon, where you don't have a history book. So, who's the loser and who's the winner? Thank you. Is there another hand that I cannot see, maybe? No. Then I will abuse my role as facilitator. And ask a question to Dr. Venman, but also to the whole uh, panel um, about women. Mm. Uh, we discussed earlier, before the panel started, about um, the gender aspects of how do we define a hero and how do we define aggressive behavior. But also, um, in your presentation, Professor, you talked about minorities being able to, through reflection about failure and defeat, to come up with um, challenging um, <coughs> ideas, of ch ideas challenging the established uh, leading um, concepts. So do women fit in this category? And I'm not a historian, but it seems to me that no, because there are not many women historians. So how would we explain that as a, and then, in terms of voices in social media, would that enable more female voices to be heard? Because in a way, the internet is uh, gender neutral. You can hide your identity, but still have opinions that um, might be um, reflecting women's opinions. Are we sure we don't have another question for Dr. Renman? Okay, so I will give him the floor, and then please think if you have any conclude. Is there a hand? Yes, right here. There was another one in the back. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Well, and then we'll go to the back. Yes. Oui, j'aurais une question en français. Oui, question oui. générale. Uh, certaines guerres uh, se terminent par une commission vérité réconciliation, uh, et ça donne la possibilité aux perdants d'essayer de se justifier. Uh, Maintenant, euh, est-ce que ce serait possible d'envisager une telle commission vérité-réconciliation avant la guerre Parce que ça éviterait passablement de crimes, d'horreur, et il y a des techniques maintenant euh, modernes de, de dialogue euh, pour essayer de rétablir la relation entre les adversaires qui leur permettent de se réconcilier en écoutant les besoins et les sentiments les, les uns les autres entre personnes. Et après c'est beaucoup plus facile de résoudre le problème, l'objet du problème qui, qui fait le, le conflit. Ce sont des, des une technique moderne qu'on appelle le cercle restauratif. Ma question, est-ce que ce serait possible d'appliquer ce cercle restauratif avant 
le conflit avec... Euh, moi, j'enseigne pour euh, la société civile, euh, mais est-ce que ce serait possible d'appliquer cette méthode-là pour des politiciens à propos de conflits politiques Merci, monsieur. And the question back there, is this still... Perfect. Uh, good evening, Professor, and thank you to the other panelists as well. Uh, I would like to ask regarding this new development of uh, our century, really, this big data, whether, uh, I think you, you painted it in a very positive light, very optimistically, but I wonder whether this poses challenges um, since if every voice is given special attention, then no voice really is and whether one um, a historiographer has to make some executive decision into, uh, as to what voices to prioritize and, and what um, events and what issues to uh, truly put out there. And that, of course, entails some silencing of others. So I, I guess my question is whether this is the same challenge as ever, uh, what a good historiographer has to um, highlight and what to dismiss. And whether the big data actually complicates this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I mean, what would happen if we have this session earlier in the day? The question would even be better. My God, this is so good. So <laughs> let me let me um, let me just briefly, also in the interest of time, note this. The question you point out on Syria on the on the history book. Um, I wonder that generally the notion of a it depends what's in the book, or it depends whether it's a structured, whether the notion of book is in fact the right notion. So one thing is what's in the book. Is there a spectrum of understanding in the book, or is there a demand for a unified narrative that unifies Syrians where they are, wherever they are? Hmm? Or is there the need to really have an understanding of what are the different, different perspectives that different stakeholders of the Syrian community, wherever they are, think about specific events, responsibilities, as well as simply facts on the ground. So that's what I was there. But is this in a book, or will this be done in a in a social in a in another type of format? This is I don't know. I, I don't know that because the history book it seems to, to seems to be a very antiquated format that doesn't kind of connect to many young people anymore. The um, issue of the big data and whether positive or negative, I agree with you. It's like having, having 150 radio channels on at the same time. Um, you don't listen to what's important. But this is where professional integrity of historians and also the rules of the games in making sense of history is so important. Historians have a professional integrity of studying sources. What is What accounts as a source for history? It's like all of the efforts which are currently undertaking of what is evidence that is acceptable under courts um, so that there are individuals being accounted, uh, will it be accounted for in some sort of judicial environment that may be created for Syria. Mm -hmm. These are professions that have professional integrity and this is where it is so important to kind of cut through this cacophony of cyberspace. Now, the good thing is, this type of professional integrity could be programmed through artificial intelligence programs. How this works, don't ask me, but I understand it's possible. Um, so where, where one can program algorithms that go through all of these big data points uh, with the same type of, of programs with the same type of assumptions that are necessary to do this type of algorithmic work. We don't want to put these two gentlemen out of work through artificial intelligence. <laughs> the, the, the human voice and the human area of judgment is still important, but it can help to go through this mass of, of, of data which is still out there. <laughs> Finally, on the, on the Truth Commission before the war has started, uh, in our professional jargon we may call this um, early warning. Uh, and your organization, Katya, knows better than others how intensively in the year 2010, roughly, many individuals around the world, experts with great experience in the Middle East, have gone around European capitals and said, there, if you don't act, something really terrible will happen in Syria. 
and early warning and the truth commission may be, may be something, but unless there is a stronger willingness to urge, to act by actors who have the, the leverage of power over military establishments, to unleash military establishments, um, you can have as many commissions as you want or early warning, um, the effect will not be there. The women question. The women question, um, of course. Now, I think what we've seen um, around the, the negotiation in Syria, um, there has been a very important participation of the stakeholder, of the voice of women that was mobilized around Syria. And I think there is a lot of phenomenal learning that comes from this case. Um, it's not about the, the voice of women just because they're women. It's about the organization and the ability to act as a political platform in an ongoing negotiation process that is so important. So I think that was a very important message that in the early days of the negotiation was sent by the special representative to the civil society movements. And that is, I think, a, a, a lesson that goes way beyond, not just for the recognition of, 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 of positions and interests that are important to women, but all stakeholders. Yeah. It's the ability to mobilize and leverage your voice and impact the negotiation. Mm -hmm. Now, this may have, when we see the evolution of the negotiation in Syria, one may say there may have been lever little leverage on the negotiation position, but it is an ongoing negotiation. And, but the, the ability to articulate interests into a platform and then leverage these interests that is what will become more and more important also with respect to the decision of how history will be written in Syria, Libya and many other countries. I think the most prudent way to proceed might be to give the last word to our speakers since it's already 8.45 and people might be getting tired instead of having more questions but I'm sure we can all stay and answer more questions um, after the panel for those who still have burning issues they want to discuss. Maybe we'll go this way first and, and then we, and then uh, Dr. Van Mollen, if you still have final comments, you're welcome to come in. Um, I'll listen to the questions and, and just as a, again, um, thinking of the catalog of the exhibition, the oldest item in the exhibition is a peace treaty which dates back to 2500 BC in cuneiform. It's sort of a nail of cuneiform between two cities in Shumel, which is today in Iraq. And the last one, I think, is the Dogon process of 2018 or the ETA, the ETA peace treaty, uh, which, which Pierre, in fact, was part of that, that commission, um, and the Basque conflict, which is now, so last two years. So got about last five, year. Last year. So you've got about four and a half thousand years in between. Um, There's a lot of history. Um, some questions are perennial. And we tend to think that because of modern technology or other issues, the things change. It's not the first time that modern technologies change the way history is written, the printing of the, the printing revolution of the 14th, 15th century did that. The move, if you go earlier, to parchment did that from papyrus at the time. One interesting example, and it's in the catalogue I wrote about it, is the images that we have of the past which are very hard to change. For the last 1,400 years, we had an image of the conquest, the Arab conquest of the Middle East which is the Arab conquest of 637 and so on and so forth, coming out of Arabia. Most of the accounts that we had were Christian accounts, Sophonius of Jerusalem, who wrote about blood and horror and so on and so forth. Whatever. And then comes new technology, most importantly what we call chemical archaeology, which is carbon-14, the question of testing grounds. And the expert on this is a man, the professor at the Hebrew University, Guido Avni, who managed actually through UNESCO to build a database of also not only for Israel and Palestine, but also for Jordan and for Syria and for Lebanon, together with the American University in Beirut. And what do you know? Not a single 
trace of burning, so carbon-14, so when you burn a place, right, and it goes to the ground, it becomes charcoal, and you have carbon-14. A database which took him 25 years to build, of well over 220 sites, in not a single case has he found, or his counterparts at the American University in Beirut or in Damascus, have found any trace of burning of the Arab conquest. And on the contrary, he has proven through carbon-14 that the right wing of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, where I was born, was actually built 50 years after the conquest. And so then we understand the Sophonius of Jerusalem's account is fake news. <laughs> and fake news is not very new right, in this case. The technology changes, but not the phenomenon of what we want to say for our political ends. In this case, for Sophonius, the bad Arabs. Right? Um, and don't confuse him with the facts, because he had his opinions. What I'm trying to say is, when we think of these questions, it would be worthwhile to look back into history, into episodes and periods girdled with, with, with propaganda, I mean, fake news and whatever. I mean, come on, it's not something new. Um, Look back because there are lessons to be learned about the challenges we're looking at now, granted the technological differences. Thank you very much. So in, in order to give the, the, the women question to you credit, um, of course, history does not belong to historians, um, and particularly not to academic um, uh, uh, people at the university level. So history, historiography is, is a business of the common man, the common woman. So always, histories have always been um, um, told, rationalized, retold, rewritten um, um, by all kinds of people. Um, the problem seems to me, for me that w if, when women told history and reported historiography, it was a kind of male version. And so it's not who does it. It's more how it is uh, how it is narrated, and that has changed. Mm -hmm. So for, for the better. Uh, my last comment: I, I spare my question on, on multilateralism. Uh, not, not so sure um, whether 21st century can be uh, described um, like that, and reframe it in terminology of Niall Ferguson, whom I don't like, and particularly not his political leanings. <laughs> Um, but he's a brilliant guy. Yeah, he wrote a book two or three years ago, The Square and the Tower. Mm. And you see what's coming. Yeah. The hierarchy and the network. Um, how do we deal with guerre, la guerre et la paix in an era of, 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 of sharp hierarchies? There we have peace treaties. There you go on with peace treaties and Metternich and, and, the, and Bismarck and, and Napoleon III. Uh, um, and, and, and so forth. But he, his, his observation is that, the, that the, 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 the age of the tower is more or less over. That, that on huge databases with, with, with gigantic maps and networks, all kinds of networks, he, he tries to prove, I'm not sure whether he's, he, he really can prove it, but he, he makes an argument that the era of hierarchy and guerre and la guerre and la, and la, and la paix entre, uh, entre états nations, on, on, uh, the, between the, state, the nation states, um, is roughly between, say, the French Revolution and 1960, mm. or more precisely, 1860, 1960. <laughs> These hundreds, and they are the exception. The rule are networks, the square, the piazza. Um, and he proves this with, with all kinds of visualizations of, of networks. So my last thought on the occasion of this um, uh, evening and this, uh, this, uh, these, these three talks is, how do, uh, is, is, is la guerre et la paix the same in the era of networking? In the era of, uh, when, when, when politics does no longer work along hierarchical lines. If Madame Merkel in Berlin um, is uh, replaced by somebody else. The same problems 
um, uh, are, are there. There is no German social policy and economic uh, policy. It's, it's all intertwined. It's all it's all in, inter, interwoven uh, with one another. There may be states. Uh, China tries to prove uh, au contraire, yeah. where the hierarchy is pretty established. But what I see is that the that the society um, uh, I live in, even if it does not exceed the Euro enter the European Union, is is a network society. Is 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 not their borders that don't mean anything. Um, uh, or are, are not as sharp as they used to be, to be more precise in the Swiss case. Not as sharp as they used to be. So, uh, the, um, peace and, um, um, peace and be, war and peace are probably very different in the ages, in the age of, of, uh, of the tower than in the age of the piazza and the, and the interwoven uh, uh, networks of, of our societies. And we are proof of that. Um, yeah, I studied in Jerusalem, and, and we before this conference we, we talked about about Mount, Mount, Mount Scopus. Um, I, I met him on a uh, on I share with him a German background. I'm, I'm, I met him on a conference on uh, with the Capbranche period in, in in our history department in in, in Fribourg. So the, the the coming from different backgrounds is 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 not the exception. No, uh, we are networked. T together and how can uh, war, war and violence uh, uh, takes on very different shapes in under, under circum, uh, on the piazza than in the tower. Thank you. Achim, do just, you want to add closing words? Just briefly. Yeah. And I think following a base building on what you work, uh, heading a network of about 4,000 individuals working on peace building and peace mediation processes, I see this on a daily basis. And this is also the reason why Geneva Peace Week is out there because there are not so many, many tents where networked individuals can meet once in a while. Um, so this is what I always say that the La Genève Internationale that we, that we feel so passionate about comes out of a notion of a tower-type world. But now where we go towards is a Genève Transnationale, which is much more networked. You have about 20 networks such as mine. There is, of course, the mega network, which is the World Economic Forum, just across the road from here. And Geneva has become a hub of networks, which is no longer necessarily a hub of these institutions that are still relatively hierarchical. So, which connects to the way of what you said. If we want to defend multilateralism, um, what is the type of multilateralism we want to defend in the city? Uh, what are the principles and the unity of vision behind those? What are the principles that these stand up for? And just let me perhaps highlight, there will be a new kid on the block in this town, which is the Cyber Peace Institute, a $20 million investment by Microsoft, by Facebook, and other actors. Because cyber peace is something that they care about. Um, and they go through a network type of way of working. Um, so that is just a reminder that the change is happening in front of our eyes and that we need to also adapt the way our, we think about peace and war through an exhibition like we have here at the Bodmer and that we will have in Berlin in 2022 so that we can adapt ourselves to step up to our task to live up to defend the peace that is worth fighting for.